Good morning. We're glad you're here this morning. Let's stand and we're going to sing Heavenly Sunlight. Our Father, we are glad to be here this morning, glad to be in your house, glad to be with fellow believers in Jesus. We just pray that uh, your spirit would be with us this morning, your hand would be on, uh, upon John Travis as he brings a message, 
in a bit, and we just uh, thank you for each person that's here and pray that we will be drawn closer to you in this service. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It is good to have you here this morning. Uh, we are happy to have John Travis Smith of Texas Baptist Men is with us this morning uh, in Brother Tim's absence, and we, we're grateful for you, John Travis, being here and Holly playing for us this morning. We're always glad. And if you're a visitor, I just want to welcome you and uh, tell you that you are very welcome here. And I think you will find a church that, uh, that loves Jesus and that loves each other. And uh, should you feel led to be a part, you would be very welcome. Let's uh, continue singing, and we're going to sing The Way of the Cross Leads Home. Thank you. 
good this morning. Thank you. Well, good morning. It's great to be back with you. I'm so glad when uh, Brother Tim called me and said, uh, could you fill in for me? And I was excited to be able to do that for you, and it's great to be back here with you. If you would, open your copy of God's Word to the book of Daniel. We're going to be there in a very familiar story to you. Uh, but it, I know it's the season of going back to school. Uh, we started that. Everybody's excited. I see the excitement on our students' faces this morning. It's just undeniable, the glow that you have, that you get to restart homework and all the assignments and everything. Uh, but for the rest of us, I know it's, uh, even if you don't have kids, it, uh, it involves you because if you drive through a school zone, all of a sudden all those are back active again. So especially where I live, it uh, makes my commute like 10 minutes longer just because of the added uh, slow speeds that we have. But there's a lot of uh, hostility that comes with a lot of that because we're having to restart uh, our life. We're having to restart all of those schedules, um, the two-a-days, and all the things that we have to do. And uh, I love the book of Daniel here. We're going to read a story about uh, students actually going back to school. So I tried real hard in the Bible to find uh, where, where kids were going to school. And I think I found this one here. And I know you're familiar with this passage in Daniel 1. Uh, but even more so than, than going to school, I think Daniel really has a lot to share with us about living in a hostile world. And I don't know if you've turned on the TV lately, but we live in a lot of hostility, don't we? Uh, have you been on Facebook? You've been on any of those things. There's a lot of hostility around, not just with election, but everything else going. There's a lot of problems around the world here, uh, even in our own backyard. Uh, but the Lord has a, a word for us to tell us, and that's what I want to look at this morning of what that looks like. So if you're in Daniel 1, again, a familiar chapter, but I would just ask you to read this maybe with fresh eyes and to see if there's something new that we can see here, a word from God. It says this uh, in verse 1, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. And then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, the youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank, and they were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. And among those were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs came, gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned you food and drink, for why should he see that you are in the worse condition than the youths who are his own age? And so you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward who the chief of the eunuchs had assigned him over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink, and let our appearance and the appearance of the youth who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this manner, and he tested them for ten days. And at the end of ten days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youth who ate the king's food. So the stewards took away their food and wine they were given to drink and gave them vegetables. And as for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel, understanding all the visions and dreams, at the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Father God, as we open your word this morning, Father, I know that uh, there's people that come into this place, Father, that they uh, have heaviness on their heart. Lord, there's things they struggle with. There's people they struggle with. And Father, as we look into your word this morning, Father, I just pray that you would give us spiritual eyes to see, Lord, how you would have us to live in a condition such as that. Father, I pray not the words that I speak, but you speak. And Father, I just pray that you would cut through these pages to our hearts. 
And Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just to give you a brief background of where we are. So we had the nation of Israel. They had a civil war. They broke into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord, and the Lord allowed them to be taken into captivity. The southern kingdom did not learn the lesson, and a few years later, uh, they also were sold into captivity. And they were sold here to the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar. And if you look there, it says they are taken to the land of Shinar. And if you're biblical scholars, you remember some of the biblical stories. Uh, do you remember anything that happened in Shinar? Well, it was the Tower of Babel. So what God is essentially saying is to his people here, these are the people of faith, and they have rejected God and say, God, we don't want to do what you want to do. We're going to ally ourselves politically. They got in a political argument uh, between Babylon and Egypt, and they came out on the raw end of that deal. All, God told them, stay out of it, stay faithful, do what I tell you. And they said, no, we're going to enter into this. We're going to try to, to manage this ourselves and see if we can get ourselves out of the situation. And they ended up completely messing it up. And so what God's message here is, if you want to live like the world, you want to live like I don't exist, like you're equal to me, then I'm going to send you back to the very beginning of where that happened. You're going to live in the land of Shinar now. So they cart the very best of all that Israel has, because Nebuchadnezzar doesn't just want to defeat Israel. He wants to basically erase them, assimilate them into his culture. So whoever wasn't killed uh, or put into slavery was taking the very best of the best, and he's going to take that for himself, and he's going to re-educate them in concentration camps. Okay? Now, the, the parents of these guys, and I want to say that it says youth here, and if you picture them in your mind real fast, look at... Just think about when you think of Daniel and his three friends. How old do you think they are? Well, if you grew up in Sunday school, you usually have pictures of these little tiny boys, right? They're, they're young boys. But really, these guys are like 15 to 20 years old, okay? So that's where we are. So any of the, anybody in that, it's, it's a youth a little bit older, teenager, young adult. That's who we're talking about here. And you have to imagine that, that Daniel is taken from his land. He's taken from his home. His birthright is removed. His parents are likely killed. And even this, he's going to be put into the, the, the service of the king. And to be put into the service of the king, you have to be made most likely a eunuch. So he was castrated, and any future that he hoped, hoped to have is completely removed. So if you put yourself in that situation, how likely is it that you're going to want to do what you're asked to do in that place? If it's like me, it's not a lot, Right? Uh, I, I don't want anything to do with these guys. These guys are completely against everything that I know, everything that I've, I've, I've studied. They've killed my family. They've taken away my future. They've mutilated my body. I want nothing to do with them. And so this is where we come into this passage. And sometimes I think we think that uh, we as Christians uh, have, a, have a lot of people that um, persecute us, and in our way certainly do, but, but understand that this is real persecution. Okay, This is... This is extreme here. They don't just want to bring them in. They want to completely change their identity. And to do that, they're not even going to be able to be called by the names that they were given. We're going to give them completely false names or names of false gods so that every time that their name is mentioned, it's praising a false god. And if you even ask today someone named uh, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, most Christians today probably wouldn't know who we're talking about. How do we know them? by their false names, right, by the names that they were given. So he completely changes who they are and their identity. And, I, and we had some students that we sent off to college uh, back in May, and it was this whole thing of we told them, uh, you've been trained, you've been in a, a community of faith, you've learned some things, and we're sending you out into the world. And there's some people out there that want to completely change your identity, who you believe in, what you believe, and it's going to be up to you whether you stay faithful to that or that you give in to that. And so we have these guys, and this is the situation they're in. And if we as believers, if we're in this situation, there's typically three ways that we respond to these things. Uh, there's a group, uh, one of the ways that we do that is with, withdrawal. So if we're in a, in a tough situation and there's hostility, a lot of times what the Christian community does is we withdraw. Uh, an example of this would be the Essenes that were in the New Testament. These were the guys that lived out in caves down by the Dead Sea. There's where the Dead Sea Scrolls came from. They just said, you know what? Uh, Rome is terrible. Everything is terrible. We're going to withdraw. We're going to start our own community, and it's just going to be us four and no more. Okay? Do you know any believers that do that? 
we just don't want to do anything. I'm not going to be on social media. I'm not going to be out in the public anywhere else. I'm just going to just remain with my family and our, our faith community and not have any influence, no missionary outreach whatsoever to the community. So that's one way. Uh, another way is Christians will compromise. There's this, uh, they will assimilate. There's uh, syncretism that, that comes in. And we have this as well in the New Testament. We have the Herodians who uh, welcomed Rome in who were Jewish but said, you know what, we're going to assimilate, we're going to take on everything that you think, and we're going to make that our own. Uh, you're not even going to know that we're, we're different from someone else. We're going to try to be as close as we can to who the Romans are and what they do. Do we know Christians like this? Sometimes we call them carnal Christians, right, where they're a Christian in name only. Maybe we only see them on an Easter or, or a, you know, Christmas if we're lucky. Um, we wouldn't really know that. They speak just like the world, they act just like the world, uh, just Christian in name only. And then another way that we do this is there's some people who want to stage a hostile takeover. We're mad because what we see happening to our faith, and so we want to be uh, out there host in a hostile way trying to push things and trying to make things happen. And they had this in the New Testament as well. These guys were the zealots. Jesus actually had one of these zealots as one of his 12 disciples, where they're going to forcibly try to take over and take back what they feel is theirs. And these are the three main ways that believers, when, there's, when they're living in... The times that we live, that's how they respond. But these are all ways that the flesh responds. The flesh. We're trying to make something happen. We're trying to keep from something else. But there's another way, and I want to talk about that this morning, a spiritual way that we do this. Uh, if you would just look with me here. If you look in verse 6, it says, Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. This is a pretty important verse here. Because it says a couple of things. One, it's saying that, you know, even though God has allowed the nation of, the, of Judah to be taken captive, there is a remnant that God has left there. We see here that even in all the bad things that just happened, God is faithful here. That the story is not over. That he has kept some that he is going to use, and those are going to be his faithful few. And what they're doing here is these guys, they know who they are, they know their identity, and they're coming together. Part of when we respond... Uh, when we respond to a, a, a whole other uh, hostile world is we do this in a righteous way. We respond righteously, and part of the way that we do that is that we find other believers and we join with them. Do you know someone who, always, who might say that, you know, I can be a Christian, but I don't have to go to church? Well, let me tell you, Christianity is a group project. Hey, it just is. And that's what they're doing here. They're finding like believers, they're coming together, and they're going to join because they're going to help one another out. When one has a problem, the other one is going to help. When three of them are faced with a fiery furnace, all of a sudden we're going we're gonna to have all of them there. Okay? We're going we're gonna to get strength in numbers, and we're going we're gonna to help each other. And that's what we're to do as a church. When we see someone falling, we go and help them. We, we help them along. And that's what Daniel and his friends are doing here, is that they're, they're joining together and they're resolving to do that. And if you go to verse 8, it says this. It says, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile the himself with the king's food. So Daniel is saying not just that we're going to join together, but that I'm going to resolve myself to follow what I know to be true. I just wonder, when I was thinking about this with my own girls, and I've got, I have four of them, I'm just thinking if they were in the same spot, and all of a sudden their parents were no more, and they had to go live with someone else, even if they were not believers, would they still know the right thing to do, and would they do it? That kind of scares me as a parent thinking that. Now, these guys are 15, but if you think about your own kids, your own grandkids, do they know the truth? Are they resolved to follow the Lord? I think in church, sometimes we're just comfortable with everyone having this, uh, you know, that we just look like we're doing the right thing. But in your heart of hearts, are we following the Lord and are we doing the right thing? And Daniel here has resolved himself along with his friends that we're going to follow the Lord. This is not a hope. This is not a wish. We know the truth and this is what we're going to do. We're going to follow that. He's going to stand firm on the solid ground that he knows because he knows that's the right thing to do. Can you imagine the first time you were ever away from home, away from family or away from people that knew you and you had all the possibility to do anything that you wanted? I mean, Daniel could have ran full length and just said, I'm going to embrace all the hedonism of the Babylonians. I'm going to welcome everything that they want to give me. But Daniel says, you know what? I know the truth. I know the right thing to do, and I'm going to stand firm. And those are the kind of, of children, those are the kind of believers that we need to have. 
that they know and they do what the scripture tells them because it's hidden in their heart. Just imagine this, Daniel doesn't have a pastor. He doesn't have a Sunday school teacher. He doesn't even have a Bible. How does he know what the word of God says? Because he's hidden it in his heart. It is part of who he is and what he is. And when you look at that verse eight, that's the second part is we have to know the Lord. We have to know what the Lord, uh, who the Lord is through his word, through walking with him. And that's what Daniel knows. He knows this. And he tells the king in verse 8 here, he, he's, he's, he sets himself, the, well, the chief of the eunuchs, that he doesn't want to defile himself. He's, some of you heard of the Daniel diet? He's not tar, start, trying to start a diet craze. It's not what he's doing. Why is that he eating the food? Because it's not kosher. It's not according to the scripture. It's been sacrificed to idols. It's not prepared in the right way. So he knows even in the little bit of a freedom that he has, a little bit of choice that he has, he's going to do what God has told him to do. And part of that is not taking the choices of the, of the food that the king wants to offer. So it's not about a diet. It's about him saying, this is what scripture says, and this is what I'm going to do. The other part of that is the king, it says, gives him a portion from his table. And what that means is, is when you take the king's portion from his table, what you're saying is, all my dependence is on this king. I live and breathe because this king gives me food, he gives me drink, and this is who I owe everything to. And when Daniel says, no, I'm not going to do that, what's he saying? He's saying, I don't need your portion because my portion is in the Lord. I don't need what you have to offer. I only need what God will give me, and that will sustain me in whatever I have. And let me tell you, that is a powerful statement that he's making there. And if you, if you know, if you go to, uh, to, to Kings, you'll find that the evil king Jehoiakim here, he's gladly accepting of the king's portion. He gets fat off of the king's portion. There are so many believers that we, we, don't, we love the world so much that we'll take whatever they give us and we'll, we'll love that and we'll, we'll give ourselves to it. And what Daniel's saying is, I don't need that. I need only what the Lord gives me. He is my portion. He is what sustains me. And I think there's, there's so many times as believers where we go and we're, we're so ready to grab whatever the world has for us. And let me tell you if, you, if you're so concerned about what the world has, what the world has to offer, what portion do we have in the Lord? And that's what Daniel's saying here. So he's making this, making this statement here. And if you read on here, he, he, in verse 8, he's going to talk to the chief eunuch. So he goes to the, the chief eunuch and he's going to talk to him. So one is we're supposed to live righteously, but we're also supposed to live peaceably. Daniel's not at aught, he's not at war with this, this eunuch. He knows the eunuch is just following orders. He's doing what he's supposed to do. So it says here, he goes to the chief of the eunuchs and asks that he allow him not to defile himself. So he's going to go to the eunuch, he's going to go privately, he's going to go politely, and he's going to ask him. I think there are so many believers who are so ready to just fight and put something in somebody else's face because they don't believe what we believe. And it's easy to do it on social media, right? Somebody says a comment, and it's real quick to type out a response and tell them how stupid they are and how far away that is that's ungodly. And what does that do for us? Makes us feel better, right? But does that bring that person any closer to knowing the truth of who Christ is? Uh, a lot of times at Christmas it happens a lot because someone will say, uh, you're checking out, and so ha happy holidays. <laughs> I was with one, one lady one time. Uh, she was in front of the line, and she's like, you mean Merry Christmas. The lady was doing her job. That's what she's told to say. Like, there's no reason to get mad at her for that. She's just trying not to be offensive. You can, they say happy holidays. I love to say happy holidays and a very Merry Christmas. You see the difference? But we as Christians love, I think, to go start a fight. Some of us, that's our personality. We love to get in an argument. We love to start something. And Daniel's not doing here. He's not pressing his rights. He's not making threats. He's not being a spoiled brat and acting entitled. He goes to him in private so that he doesn't embarrass him, and he just says, uh, is there any way that we can do something else? I'm trying to do something. So he, he's going to live peaceably here with him. He's going to try everything that he can. And if you look in verse 9, it says, and God, and God gave Daniel favor, favor and compassion in the sight of the chief eunuchs. God is going to give him favor. He actually likes the guy. We're supposed to find favor with others. There's a lot of people that just don't like Christians, not because of what they believe, but who they are, right? They're just mean. They're sticks in the mud. They're nobody anybody wants to hang around with. And who is that going to attract to the Lord? If you're a missionary and you're out there and nobody likes you, are you going to be very effective? Of course not. 
If you're running the food pantry and you're not very kind when people come in, are you really doing anything to help the kingdom? Of course not. But the eunuch actually likes him. And we know that the same thing happens with Jesus, that he grew in, in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So people actually like Jesus. A lot of times they have problems with his followers, though, right? <laughs> and I can be in one of those, those camps sometimes. But he, we're supposed to live in favor. And he's going to him, and the guy genuinely likes Daniel, so he's going to try to help Daniel out. And the other part of this is he's going he's to consider the interest of others. What does the eunuch tell him? What's the problem why the eunuch doesn't want to do this at first? What does it say there? You've got your copy. What, what is the problem? He's going to lose his head, right? Literally. You're going to endanger my head. I'm going to lose it if I do what you're asking me to do. And so Daniel understands his position. And so what does Daniel do? He offers a workable solution. Let me help you help me. I think a lot of times the believers don't want to do that. They just say, do what I say because this is the right thing to do. We don't have this way where we consider the interest of others, what their worries, what their fears are, and how we can help them if we need something ourselves. We just want to make it happen. We want to press our rights. We want to be that kind of person, and it just doesn't work. So Daniel empathizes with this guy. He understands the position he's in, and he's, he's going to try to help them out. And if you read further in verse 17, it says, As for these youth, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Daniel was put in this position, and he's told to do something and to learn some things that he knows is not the truth. But what does Daniel do? What does it say happens here? He says he's got all learning and skills and literature. So they put him in Babylonian literature 101. And how does he, what grade does he get in the class? A plus, right? He knows none of that's the truth. They put him into astrology classes. He knows that's completely against the Bible and what the Lord says. But what does Daniel do? He learns it. And so much, if you read on, he gets in charge of all the other magicians and all the enchanters and all those people. He's the magna cum laude of Hogwarts, okay? Get that? Like, he, he understands it, he gets it, he trains, and he learns, and he takes a test, and he gets it. But here's the thing, he doesn't practice it. And we know this because when the king has a vision and he says, okay, I want you to explain my vision, and not just that, I want you to tell me what my vision is, no one else can do it, and what does Daniel do? Does he go and he starts throwing down chicken bones and looking at stars? Is that what he does? What, is it, what does the Bible say? Anybody know? He hits his knees, he prays, he goes to the Lord. So he can know all this and know that this is not what we use and this is, this is the way that, that we actually operate. We're actually going to do what God says. All the training they gave this guy, and he doesn't even use it. It's awesome. And just know when you go to uh, some of the students that are in here, if you go to school, um, if you have to even go to college, I remember being in a geology class and we have to learn about how many uh, 50 million years old this bone is or this rock is. And I had some believers in that class that like, ah, we're just not doing this. This is all fake. We don't believe it. And so they thought that was their license to fail and be terrible students. But what does the Lord say if we find something, uh, or if hand finds something to do? We do it with all of our might. And when those students fail and the, the professor asks them about it and they just said, you know, we're believers and everything else, what we found out later, the professor was a believer as well. But no one is going to believe the way that you're going to argue and you're going to say that there's a different way if you have absolutely no concept of what they're talking about. You can know all that stuff and not have to believe something. You can know a bunch of stuff and not practice it. That's not a license for us as believers to say, I have faith and so I don't have to do any of this. I can just take a back seat and I can be lazy. I can fail. That's not what Scripture calls us to do. That's not what it is here. Daniel's learning. He's learning for the very best. He's just not using it. So much so that he's put over everybody else. Do you think he's got more sway over, what the, over those people being the best of the best or being the slack-off student in the class? We don't think about that sometimes. But Daniel here is he's regarding what others regard, keeping his own. And the other thing here is he's serving others. It says in verse 19, he stands before the king. He stands before him. And I do want to dis dispel one myth about Daniel. There's a lot of people that think that, that Daniel and his friends, they come there and, and Babylon teaches them all these things. Actually, it says, go pick out the ones who are already studious, the ones who are already capable of standing before the king. Go get those guys, and we're just going to teach them some of our stuff. Okay? 
If we send kids out into the world, we send believers out into the world, we already train them in the faith community to be able to respond and to work and to follow the Lord. We don't trust Babylon to raise believers, right? Babylon is where they're revealed, okay? That's why it's so important as we're growing up for our, our kids and for our grandkids and all those things, and even for new believers that we teach, we train, so that when we go out into Babylon, we know how to respond. And that's what Daniel's doing here. He's excelling in everything because he had already learned that in the faith community. He already learned how to follow the Lord. He learned those things, and God is giving that to him. If God really didn't want him to learn the astrology and things that he's doing, would it say God gave him all, all learning and skill in these subjects? God is helping him because God is putting him in a place that he's going to be able to speak truth into the king. But he can't do that as a failure. Okay? He's got to do that hard, in a hard way. It doesn't matter what job that you have. I remember a speech from Martin Luther King Jr. He said, if you're a street sweeper, how, how should you sweep those streets? Like Picasso making, painting a painting. If you're out in the farm, it matters if your rows are straight, doesn't it? It matters if you're a teacher, how you grade, how you treat students, doesn't it? All those things, that matters to the Lord. So it says we're to, to live righteously, we're to live peaceably, and the last thing I want to show you is we're to live eternally, live with an eternal mindset. Uh, so many times we're focused on the here and now, and like we've talked about, we, want to, we see someone and they're doing the wrong thing and we're mad at that person. Who, ought we, who is our real fight against? Is it against flesh and blood? Or is it against the powers of darkness? It's not that person themselves, but it's the spirit behind that person. And if you're so mad at that person, are we ever going to be able to reach them for the Lord? We're not seeing things the right way. Daniel here, he is a slave. But his whole mindset is completely different. He's saying, you can enslave my body, you can make me learn these things, but you can't change my heart. You can change my name. You can mutilate my body, you can take away my future, but you can't have my spirit, you can't have my soul. I'm worried about the one who's in control of my soul, not the one who's in control of my physical body. That's where Daniel comes in, and that's so powerful that he does that, where he doesn't care. It's, I'm going to stick with the Lord, I'm going to trust in him. He's going to put his hope in the Lord's faithfulness, and that's what we need to do. We need to put our hope in the Lord's faithfulness, that even if we're called to go through the most hostile environment, you can imagine the, the, the greatest trials and tri tribulations there are that God is going to see us through. Here's the thing. Does Daniel ever see freedom? He dies in captivity. And if you don't understand that you can be held in bondage, but yet be redeemed, and not leave bondage, and you don't understand the redemption story. If you don't understand how you can have cancer and every other kind of ailment and never be healed but still redeemed, then you don't understand what God's doing, okay? Daniel understands it doesn't matter what my situation is. Here's, here's my response. My hope, my faith is in the Lord and what is, what is to come. I love that. Uh, if you actually go back, um, I want to read one thing here, the last, the last chapter here. It says, and Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, this is a throwaway verse, right? It's just at the end. doesn't mean anything to us. But this is hugely important. Who's got him captive right now? Do we remember who I said? The Babylonians. And the, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in. He's going to have this dream. He's going to be interpreted. And Daniel's whole thing through, throughout this dream is there's going to be these kingdoms. Your kingdom is going to fall. Then there's going to be another kingdom. That kingdom's going to fall. There's going to be another one. That kingdom's going to fall. But I serve the God whose kingdom is eternal. And you're perfectly fine to have me in bondage, have me in chains now. It looks really dark for me now, but let me tell you, in the future, he works it out. In the future, he wins. That I serve the kingdom that is going to take over all of these. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to fall. The Medes and Persians are going to fall. And then we're going to have King Cyrus here. Cyrus is not a Babylonian name. It's a Persian name. So he's going to serve until the Persian Empire. So the very people that took him captive, that killed his parents and all those bad things, he's going to say, you know, you can have me in bondage, have me in chains, but you're, one, you're going to be defeated. You're going to be in chains. And he is going to serve the king that is eventually going to allow the exiles to return and to rebuild the temple. 
And so he's not, a, he's, not a, he's not one of the ones who's released, but God is allowing him to see into the future. Here's what I have. This is what I have planned for my people, that I'm going to take you over these 70, 80 years of captivity, and I'm going to make this, I'm going to redeem this situation. That even though it looked bleak, it looked like I didn't know what I was doing, that I had lost control, that, you, that others had no faith in me, that I was already working it out at the very beginning. Because if you go back to that chapter, he has those Hebrew names there that he puts in that place that these are going to be the guys that are going to end up triumphing in the very end. And they won't see it in this lifetime. They're not going to make it there, but they will in the end. That's incredible. And you know what? When I look at his name and I see all the things that he has, the one guy that we, that we still call by his Hebrew name is Daniel. When I don't know if you remember the story later on. They're going to have the writing on the wall. And there, no one's going to be able to answer this. And there's a queen that comes up, and she said, Oh, king, do you remember? There is someone that can interpret dreams, that can do these things. It's better than anyone else. And his name is Daniel. He never loses his identity or who he is. People know who he is. Because what he has sown, he reaps in the end. And I would just ask us where, where we are this morning. What are we sowing into? Because what are we looking for our harvest to be? Have we lived in such a world that has, has so much trial and tribulation where we look at the Lord and say, Lord, I don't think that you can handle this. I'm going to work the situation out for myself. I'm going to handle it myself. How did that work out for the nation of Judah and Israel? It doesn't. Who does? It's the ones who remain faithful to him that say, even though I live in this, this crazy, crazy world that you have me in, where my parents have been killed, all these bad things have happened to me, that I'm going to remain faithful to you and what you have called me to do. That I'm going to lash myself to the mass no matter the storm that surrounds me, and I'm going to remain faithful to you. I'm going to follow you even in the darkness when I can't see where we're going and it doesn't make sense. It doesn't look like you know what's going on. It looks like we have no future. Daniel's saying, I'm going to remain with you. And I would just encourage you, church, that these are the ways that we live eternally, that we live righteously, that we live peaceably with others, so that not just us, but others can join with us, that can join the kingdom that will ultimately survive. And I would just encourage you, if you find yourself in these trials and tribulations and you have no idea where, the, where up is up and where down is down, you can't see forward, we still trust in the Lord. He doesn't call us to know every step. He just asks us to trust and obey. Trust and obey. Trust in him. Have our faith in him to where if, if he doesn't come through, we're sunk. And that's where Daniel is. And even though he's never released from bondage, even though none of that is ever made, made whole, at the very end, we still speak of Daniel. He still speaks to us. That God redeems him in the end, and his kingdom wins. And that's where we are. And church, I would just encourage you, when, we're, when we have these trials and tribulations, to look beyond those people, to look beyond of what we see, because God has called us to do something very hard, and that is to love our enemies, to love those who persecute us, and to move forward with him. And when we're out there and you're going through your daily life, try to put those different glasses on to where we see that, and to have your trust in the Lord no matter what you find. Would you stand with me and let's pray? Father God, we thank you so much, Lord, that you don't just call us and leave us. But Lord, you call us and you say that you will walk through us, that you won't necessarily save us from trials and tribulations, but you won't ever leave us in them. And Father, I just pray for anyone here now, Lord, who does not have that assurance of faith, who does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior and cannot say that. Father, maybe this morning you've moved on their hearts to say that we need to, to Lord, uh, I don't know you and I need to know you. Father, maybe there's someone in here, the Lord, that's just uh, over uh, oppressed by life and what's going on. Or maybe they just need to pray where they are, pray at the front, pray with someone here. Lord, if there's someone who knows someone at work and they know the Lord's been calling out to them, maybe, Father, they just pray where they are. And Lord, give me, uh, Lord, give me the boldness to share my faith. Father, whatever the decision, Lord, I just pray in this time that we have to uh, answer your invitation, Lord, that we would be faithful to you. And Lord, we thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. I'll be down front if anyone needs to speak.
sing the third verse and the men will come forward for the offering. For nothing will have Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord, and the opportunity to come into your house this morning. We thank you for each family that is represented here with us and be with those that are not. We thank you for Brother John as he came and brought us the message that you had laid upon his heart this morning. We ask you now to be with us offering, bless the gift that uh, we may be able to use it here in your kingdom, in, to further your kingdom here on earth, Lord. These things I ask in your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> like the woman at the well I was seeking for things that could not satisfy My Savior speaking, draw from the well that never shall run dry. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want. Fill my cup, fill it up and make it whole. So my brother, if the things this world gave you leave hungers that won't pass away, my blessed Lord will come and save you if you kneel to and humbly pray fill my cup Lord I lift it up Lord come and quench this thirsting of my soul bread of heaven feed me till I want no more fill my cup fill it up and make me There will be service tonight at 6, led by Jerry McMahon, and our first Wednesday night dinner will be this Wednesday at 6, and Bible study for all ages at 6.30. The fall kickoff for ladies and men's groups, both in Iola and College Station, will start September 10th for the men on Tuesday, and September 12th for the ladies that Thursday. And I'm here today to talk about the building fund. So we have a goal of 100000 by Thanksgiving. And next week we're going to have an end gathering. We've had, this will be our second one. So we encourage you to pray this week and, and come with the offering that God lays on your heart. The second thing is on uh, September 28th, we're going to have an auction at the community center. We're going to have a meal provided uh, for you. And then we're going to have some live auction items and some silent auction items. So we highly encourage you to come to that and bring some friends. So... Hope all this will go to the building fund. Hopefully we'll, we'll have a great success with it. We know God's going to bless us. Thank you. Thank you. Let's stand and we will sing. 